بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وبه نستعين ثم الصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد ثم صل على محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين Dear sisters and brothers, salam alaikum. It's such an honor to be able to speak to you on such special and holy nights. And as you can see, I'm a little bit holier than yesterday. I've got this on and I think I look a little bit more sacred. Inshallah, as I said, the discussion we were having is very joint. Now, I know some of you may not have heard the talk from yesterday. I'll give a bit of introduction, and then we'll start tonight's talk. But if you can, if you found tonight's talk interesting, whether beautiful people here or the ones watching at home, make sure you follow the rest of the night as well, because what we're trying to achieve can only be done if the whole package is together. So that's that as well. Tonight, perhaps we're gonna be talking about one of the most important topics there ever is. And it's not me calling it the most important topic, it's Imam Ali alayhi salam, we'll get there. But before we start tonight's talk, let me say a little bit about what happened yesterday for some who were not there. Yesterday, the main thing that we're trying to discuss was that religion came to create an inner change inside us. And if that inner change does not take place, pray for however much you want, 40 years, 50 years, 60 years, or fast for 10 years, 20 years, it's not going to be useful. We know that even the people who killed some of our a'imme were who fought of Quran. Some of them had prayed so much that they had, a, you know, their skin on the forehead had a mark of how long their sajdas were. But they even killed the imam of their time. So, prayer, fasting, all of these, as long as they don't lead to an inner change, they're not going to help us on their own. And we mentioned so many ahadith from the Prophet, from Amir al muminin even we have from Lady Fatima, that these are all there to create an inner change. Let me just mention a little bit more so that this point sits in your heart. Because I know a lot of you may have heard this, but still may not act according to it, unfortunately. A lot of us have heard even, for example, there's a hadith by the Prophet. If you pray, it doesn't change you. It may even make you farther from God. Or the hadith that says, if you fast, but it doesn't change you, it's only hunger and thirst, no spiritual gain. We've heard this. But then when we're acting, again, we act as if the inner change is not important. You just have to pray to check the box, fast to check the box. I want to mention a few points so that this point really sits on our heart. That as long as there is no inner change, nothing is going to help us. Imagine, let's say, for example, I have jealousy inside me. I'm a jealous person. And now I've been praying for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, I've been fasting, all of that, but inside I'm still jealous. According to what I'm saying, as long as I'm jealous, none of that is going to help me. Let's say they even take me to heaven, despite my jealousy. They take me to heaven. But do you think if a jealous person goes to heaven, they're going to be happy or miserable? Let's say, I'm jealous, I didn't fix it. I was praying. I'm saying as long as that problem is inside, prayer is not going to help you much. Let's say your prayer even helped you. For the sake of argument, you go to heaven. Now imagine a jealous person in heaven. That's nightmare. If you're jealous and you see someone has something that you don't have, how does that make you feel? Horrible. 
Now, you're in heaven. Everyone's got great stuff. You see the people in higher levels. How is that going to make you feel terrible? So as long as jealousy is inside me, even if they take me to heaven, how am I going to be feeling? Miserable. In fact, in heaven, I'm going to be having much more to feel miserable over. Or if I have a kebra inside. Let's say I have kebra inside, and Lady Fatima, in one important speech she gave, she said, One of the outcomes of prayer has to be to get rid of Sheikh Jawad's kebr, Sheikh Jawad's grandiosity, Sheikh Jawad's arrogance. Lady Fatima has said this. She said, if prayer doesn't do that, it's not going to do its job. Let's say, despite this, you prayed. You didn't get rid of your keb. They took you to heaven. Even though Lady Fatima is saying that's not the case. But let's say you still go to heaven. And your keb is still inside you. What is keb? Like as a sheikh, for example, for every person, their grandiosity is different. But for a sheikh, maybe their grandiosity, their keb, could be that everyone should listen to me. If there's another sheikh that, for example, I see, oh, others are sharing his lectures on Instagram. Like, how dare they? I thought they want to listen to me. That's kibr. Everyone should listen to me. Now imagine I have this. Lady Fatima said, pray to get rid of it. I prayed my kibr didn't go. And they take me to heaven. Hope now I have that kibr and I say, for example, I see another sheikh is in heaven. Angels are respecting him. The believers are around him. How is that going to make me feel? Awful, terrible. If you've ever had jealousy inside or kebr inside, you know that's the worst pain for a person who thinks everyone should take them seriously to see another person's getting all the attention. So see, as long as these things are inside us, even if they take us to heaven, we're going to be miserable. We will make heaven into hell, let alone being in this world. So the main thing that we need to achieve is that inner change. Oh. I'm going to mention now another point as well to really get this point across. I'm not going to let this go that easily. We have a hadith from a ma'asum in which he says, if a person lies, and we have another hadith, for example, that says if a person commits um, haram adultery, the imam says, in that point that, for example, a person lies or they commit adultery, they don't have iman in their heart. Oh. If what we think is right, if what we think in the sense that inner change is not important, belief is not something that's inside you, no, belief is just the sentences that you memorize in your mind. Because a lot of us, that's what we think. No, I believe in God. I believe in the hereafter. It's not here in the heart. What is it? Some sentences in the mind. How, we do, like, how do we pass faith to the next generations? We take them to a class and we say, memorize these things. You believe in God, you believe in hereafter, you believe in angels. Where are these sentences? In your mind. Imam said when a person lies, they can't have iman in their heart. Hope a lot of us lie, whereas we still have all of those things in our head. I can easily lie and still believe there is a God, there is a hereafter. What does that show you? That this thing that we're keeping up here, these sentences, as long as they don't enter our heart, they're not iman. Iman is that thing which is inside you. Now, memorize all the sentences you want and pray for 20, 30 years. As long as it doesn't come here, the imam says what? That's not going to help you. Now, Another way to show you this is the case, because I know you may accept it, but again, tonight you go, you're going to be focusing on the amal, not what's inside. Instead of saying, okay, how can this amal change me? We just do it. Instead of thinking, hope that they said pray, so that something inside change. I know you hear all of this, but as soon as I go, I know when you pray, you forget about this. You forget that now that I'm praying, something has to change inside me. I'm swearing. I promise you're going to forget it. Or for example, I'm telling you when you read the Quran, when you read the ad it has to change inside. But as soon as I go, now you say, yes, yes, that's true. As soon as I go, tonight when you're reading the dua, again, you forget it has to change. You just read it. The imam says, if you read it, it doesn't change. It's not going to help. But you just read it. Forget about the fact that it has to change you. 
So that's why I'm keep emphasizing, like I really want to get this across, because believe me, as soon as you accept this, your experience with everything changes. What happens if you don't do this? What happens if you forget that religion, all of these amals, were to create a change inside you? What happens if you forget this? If you think that the whole purpose is that you memorize a few things and you do a certain act, you keep memorizing. Hope there is a God, there is this, these are the name of the prophets, this is Masala, and this Imam, that was the name of his mother, that was the name of that prophet, that prophet was in that land, this is the name of his group. You memorize all of these things. What happens when this, you just now have much more things to lose. You're more vulnerable to attack. You're more vulnerable to doubt. What do I mean by that? See, right now within our community, there's this whole issue. One of the scholars has given a talk, and they have said that du'a notbe may be, the, it may not be authentic. They have raised some questions on the uh, authenticity of du'a notbe. Someone has done that. How are a lot of people feeling, or with regards to another du'a? Everyone's feeling like, oh my God. Either some people are so scared, they're, or for example, they're defensive, they want to answer. Or a lot of people are thinking, wow, I've been doing du'a nudbe every Friday for the past, I don't know, 10, 15 years. If it's not correct, what's going to happen to me? All of that is gone. All of that is gone. The person feels at lost. They may feel scared. What's happening? I'm losing my religion. A lot of people are scared on this side. Let's find the person who answers them. A lot of people, you know, there's a whole situation here. Oh, this is the same with Dua Nodbe, with Dua Komel. I want to tell you how this problem could have been easily avoided. Imagine if when we read Dua Komel, Dua Iftita, Dua Nodbe, instead of thinking that I just have to read this to get the sabab, something I do. Instead of doing that, we had thought, I have to read this to create an inner change and you had actually changed. So for example, you'd been reading Dua Kumail, you'd paid attention to the lines instead of just doing it to get the thawab. For example, you read certain things about how, forgive, uh, how forgiving God is, and it had helped your relationship with God. Or you had read that, and you were like, okay, let me be more forgiving at home with my children. If God is that beautiful, he forgives me, let me be like that with my children. Or you had found some ways in which Dua Kumer had changed you inside. Or Dua Nodbe. Now imagine if they raised all the doubts in the world. So I'm not at loss. I changed. I became better with my children. My relationship with God changed. See, if you use religion to create an inner change, no one can take that away from you. And this is even a verse in the Quran. With one of the prophets, they were arguing, God can't do this, God can't do that, what if there is no God? And he says, You're discussing the details with me, with God. I feel him inside. What are you on about? See, if you feel God inside, no one can take that away from you. That's the beauty of inner change. If you read Dua Kumail, whatever other Dua, and your focus is, I want to learn from this how to change myself, no one can ever take that away from you. I use this example sometimes. Imagine you go to a gym trainer, you're a little bit overweight, you go to a gym trainer, and the gym trainer helps you. You lose the excess weight, you're very healthy, active. And then someone comes and says, you know what, it's a gym trainer, doesn't have any certificate, not qualified. Hope, what would you feel? We're like, oh my God, all these years he didn't have certificate. We're like, I don't care. I lost the pounds. I lost the fat. I don't care. It changed me. Whether it has certificate or not, it changed me. If it can change me, it's good for me. Do you see the difference? Now with Imam Hussein alayhi salam the same, with Lady Zainab the same. Lady Zainab says, Wamara aitu illa jamila. In that difficult situation, imagine, I don't need to tell you about what happened in Karbala, right? You know better than me. 
in that situation, she says, I didn't see anything but beauty. Well, instead of, if instead of, for example, just telling the story to ourselves, we think, okay, this is not something that I have. Half of what has happened to her, if it happens to me, I'm going to be so angry at God. But despite all of that, she says, How did this happen? If you take this question seriously and start engaging, what can I change in myself to get to a place where no matter what happens in life, I still see beauty? Imagine if we had started focusing on this question. And then after a few days of commemorating Karbala and Ashura, let's not say we would be like ladies in now, but at least a little bit, I, had, I would start to see more beauties in life, more patience with regards to the difficulties in my life. Imagine if that had happened. Then someone came and said, you know what, on that story, on that night, that didn't happen. We're like, I don't care. Even if you're right, even, we'll come and talk with you whether it happened or not. But even if you're right, as then let's say the whole thing didn't happen, for the sake of them. They changed me. I look at the world now, and I feel a little bit like, maybe not at the level of Lady Zainab, but I took my own steps. I had difficulties, I had an illness, I had this disability, I had, there were some problems in my life. I started trying to change myself and now I'm in a place where despite my, I have a little bit more acceptance. I have a little bit more patience. Imagine if that happened in us. Whether a person came, started asking questions. Do you know they may have had access to water on one of the nights Imam Hussein's army? Do you know this person may not have been back then? You're like, I'll come and discuss with you these historically. But mate, they changed me. I'm a different person now. Inner change is something no one can take away from you. But all the other information are just things that someone can come and make a doubt in it. It's so shaken. The more you give your kids this information, memorize this, this happened historically, this, 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 this. If the inner thing is not there, you're just making them more vulnerable for attacks. A person comes, bring a historical question, and they think like the whole thing collapses on them. And as parents, you get defensive. It becomes a whole issue for community or how we can answer that, this and that. Hope, inner change, so beautiful. It's the safest thing in the world. No one can ever take it away from us. And if you think about it, it's actually this inside. It's not our, the things we memorize. It's not the things we do. It's what's inside that matters. Even when you feel God in your life, I don't know if you've ever felt God. Maybe, maybe I said, maybe on a ziyarat, for example, Karbala. Maybe you went to Hajj. Maybe at a difficult time in your life, you were patient. Maybe after a loss, someone you really loved, you suddenly lost them, the whole thing changed, and you felt something inside. In all of those cases, whether in Karbala, in Najaf, in Mecca, that time when you felt spiritual, where did that spirituality happen? Inside you. Where did you find God? Inside you. Yes, you visited a place, so because that place was inspiring. It awakened something. But awakened it where? Inside you. That's why Allama Tabo Tabai in Tafsir of Al Mizan of the Quran, it says the place where you can meet God is inside you. There's no other place in this world you can find God. Can you find God in a room? Can you find God in a, where can you find God? The, where is that point of contact? Inside you. So, as long as we have this inner change, we're safe. If we don't have it, we become vulnerable. We become vulnerable to doubts, we become vulnerable to questions, and at the end of the day, we don't have much to take with us. Because believe me, what's inside you, you take it even to the other world. If there's jealousy, I'm gonna take it with me. If there's kibr, I'm gonna take it with me. If there's God's love, I'm gonna take it with me. But what's in your mind will go to the grave. All the sentences you've memorized will go to the grave. They're not real. You want to know how they're not real? Okay, imagine this situation. You're a mother or you're a father. Someone's come to marry your son or your daughter. And this person, let's say, he volunteers on Sunday school, for example, so he knows all of these religious sentences, all of them. He can even teach them. In fact, he has been teaching them. Look, he's been teaching about Akhirah, he's teaching about Ma'ad, different levels of heaven, hell, all of this. The guy memorized it, teaching it, passing it on to the next generation, volunteering, all of this. Oh. 
Let's say this person married your son or your daughter. And then a few days later, you see that God forbid, he's hitting your daughter. How would you feel? You'd be like, mate, don't you believe in hereafter? Didn't you teach the children? That if you do a one little bit of badness to someone, you're going to see it. Where was this when you were hitting my daughter? How can you believe that وَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِثْغَلَ ذَرَّةٍ شَرًّا Whoever does even an ounce of badness will see it, will meet it. How can you even teach that and then go and hit your child or your family or your wife? Where was that belief when you were doing that? You see a sentence in your head doesn't even help you at home. How do you expect to take it with you to heaven or to the other world? But if they felt it inside. If this sentence of the Quran, that وَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِثْغَالَ ذَرَّةٍ شَرًّا يَرَى If just this one verse comes and sits in your heart, and before every action, you feel this. If I just raise my voice at this little child, it's going to hurt me. If this just this one verse sits in your heart, it's going to change your life. Now, especially pay attention to the fact that how much our actions are important. You know, you may be just speaking to one child, maybe one moment of anger at one child. You think that's it? Finished? Do you know one shouting at a child, how much it can impact in the world? Let me give you a real example. The guy was a kind person usually, but he had an anger issue. He didn't work on it. There was a child. He did something. As a child, he does things. The guy gets angry, very harshly shouts at the child, very angry. And that child feels so hurt. Later on, he grows. This guy has forgotten. He even shouted at this child. Later on, that child grows up. And because of that bad experience, he was so hurt, he had promised himself, I'm going to be so protective over my child. So he became so strict towards his child. He wouldn't let, the go, wouldn't let the child go, limited his freedom. Who caused all of this? You who shouted at him. You turned the person a bad father. Now, the child was outside, the dad is protective. Because when he was a child, someone was very rude to him. He didn't want anyone to hurt his child. He's become restrictive. He's super worried. The child's outside. The wife comes, asks a question. Like, hey, what do you think of this? He said, can't you see he's outside? My child's outside. I'm worried for him. You're talking to me, for example, about kitchen. The heart's wife suddenly collapses. She feels very hurt. She breaks. All of this, who did it? Who broke that heart? You did it. I did it. When I shouted at that child and I forgot about it, 20 years later, that wife got collapsed, broken, hurt, because I had created something in that guy that he still hasn't managed to heal from. And this will one day get me. Now imagine if this just this one belief, and by the way, this was a real story. Now, if just this one thing sits in my heart, don't you think the community would look so much more different? How much parents would be nicer to their children, siblings to each other, couples to each other? Oh, I hope by now I've managed to get it across that inner change is important. Like I really did the whole rose of inner change is important. Oh. Now, let me see how much time I have. Oh, alhamdulillah, we've got time. Now I want to say this, that in fact... The way prophets taught religion, the way Quran wanted you to have beliefs, iman, all of that, was not something extra to add to yourself. They wanted you to find everything on yourself from within. How? Do you remember yesterday we were talking about one of the inner changes we have to make at some point in our life is to feel that we're great. According to Quran, as long as you don't feel great inside, you'll never believe in the hereafter. 
It's very interesting. How does Quran, for example, in Surah Teen, tries to show you there is a life after this life? It doesn't tell you, oh, believe in this. You know what it does? It says, look how great you are. And of course, in order for you to feel that, it may take some time. Yesterday, we spoke about some of the ways the Prophet used to make people know they're great. When a child would come to the room, he would get up. From a very young age, tell you, you're special. Me, as a Prophet, I'm getting up for you. So, Quran says the way you can know there's a life after death is to find at some point in your life greatness inside you, and then it asks you, do you think this great, beautiful thing that you are would finish when you die? Even with hereafter, it says the only time you will actually believe in it in your heart, not just a sentence in your mind, is when you see some beauty inside, some greatness inside, and then it asks you, do you think this would die with the death of your body? And we created insan in the most beautiful ways. Insan, you're so great. Now you've come to this world, you may forget how great you are. But once you feel how great you are, See the way Quran argues? It says you're so great. Once you feel that, once you look inside and you see something which is way bigger than your body, then it asks you, do you think this would die with the death of your body? So see, even a belief in, in hereafter, the way Quran wants you to really have it is from yourself, and no one will take that away from you. Now, what do I mean by this, that this greatness inside? By the way, of course, I'm not going to try and prove this to you. As I said, these things, I can't prove it to you. You have to fight it inside. But let's talk a little bit about this. What do I mean by greatness inside you? I don't know if you watched this documentary. By the way, can I have a salawat, please? Sheikh checks the time as well. Oh, wow. We have to rush. Have you watched the documentary, Your Inner Fish? Very interesting documentary. Watch it if you want at some point. One of the things they do is this. In that documentary, it's about fossils, archaeology, biology. It's very interesting. One of the things they do in that documentary is they take the fossil of the bone of an animal who lived, let's say, millions of years ago. And based on that fossil, they make some assumptions, right? For example, they found the bone, the fossil of the leg bone of an animal. And based on that, they say, okay, if this is the leg of the animal, and it's this size, it means that the weight of this animal can't be more than a certain size. Otherwise, these legs can't carry that weight. So they make some assumptions. And if its weight is around this much, we know that animals who weigh this much usually have this kind of diet. For example, they don't have meat, they have vegetables. They make all of these assumptions just based on one bone leg. Because this bone leg can't carry a heavier weight, this, that, etc. And a lot of these cases, when they make a guess, later on they find a larger fossil which has the rest of the animal's body and they see, oh wow, we were right. In a lot of cases they get it right. Why? Because in this world, there are some rules. If your leg bones can carry this much weight, then you can't be larger than that. Otherwise, you'll collapse on those legs. Now, why am I saying that? Because the Quran also treats you like this. How so? It says, see, look, there are certain things inside you. Let's look at them and make assumptions. See, some of you, I know. I know, for example, in this world, there are wives who have been taking care of their ill husband for 30 years. Isn't that so beautiful and so tough? I can't do that. 30 years taking care of a disabled husband. Where did that beauty come from? Which bone in the body requires this? Which part, which organ, your intestine requires this beauty, this love? Which part of you needs this, this greatness? 
I know someone was saying this. A few years ago in Iran, it was a heavy snow, crazy snow. And then this person was saying he had a friend that night when the snow was very heavy, sat down at home and started reading Quran. You know why? He said, I'm going to be reading Quran and asking God, praying that tonight no old person slips on the snow. Where did this beauty come from? Where did this care come from? Which animal has this? Now tonight, I don't want to try and prove afterlife to you. What I'm saying, if ever Quran wants to prove it to you, it tries to show something beautiful in you. Do you remember that night you were, for example, with your ill friend who had cancer and you were so sad, but you covered your pain and were joking in front of him? Or you went to visit grandpa and he couldn't remember you. He were, you were so sad, you wanted to cry, but you held it in. You tried to make him happy. Where did that beauty come from? Which animal has that? And then it tells you, do you think this beauty would end when your body dies? No, the body is the body of the like other animals. There's something in you greater than them. Now, I wasn't trying to prove hereafter to you. That's a journey you have to take. You have to reach in your life in a stage where you feel this greatness inside you, and then you can do the rest of it. But I'm just saying that the Quran, even when it wants to teach you about hereafter, it goes through you. And once you feel it this way, no one can take it away from you. No matter what atheist, what other religion, they come, bring arguments. Mate, I feel it inside. The same is with God. It says if you want to find God, you have to go inside. And because I know some of, the, some of you, as, as long as you don't hear a hadith, you're not going to take the lecture seriously. Even though a lot of what we said were a hadith, I just sometimes don't say the Arabic to save time. But tonight, I thought, you know what? I'm going to even mention the Arabic so they know I'm serious. Home. So, so far I was saying, see, religion, Quran, God, Prophet, the actual way, not the way sometimes we do, memorize these sentences. The way it wants to teach you is through your own self. We said about hereafter, now we're about God. Even when you want to figure out God, you have to go from inside. It says, see how great you are. Where is the source of this beauty? Where is the source of this love inside you? You're not an animal, you're not this body. You can cry for someone who died a thousand years ago. Which animal does that? Where does this mercy in you come from? You sit down, you cry over a girl who died 1,400 years ago. They hurt him and you cry. Where did this beauty come from? Which animal is like this? See, and it says your, this beauty is not going to die with your death of your body. And it says, oh, where is the source of this beauty? Start asking questions from it. And then it takes you to God. Oh. I wonder how a person who doesn't know himself or herself can ever know his God. See? You want to know your God? First, you need to know yourself. Imam Ali alayhi salam. Even when you want to know your God, they can't force it to you in theology class. They can't teach it to you like that. You have to find him inside. And when you find him inside, no one can ever take that away from you. Let's read a little bit more ahadith so you see how you are important. How taking care of yourself, paying attention to yourself is important. Again from Imam Ali alayhi salam. معرفة النفس أنفع المعارف. The knowledge of oneself, self-knowledge, is the most beneficial knowledge of all. I said tonight's topic is the most important topic. This is the hadith for it. Another one. كلما زاد علم الرجل زاد عنايته بنفسه وبظل في رياضتها وسلاحها وسلاحها جهدة. It says, as your knowledge, the real knowledge, increases of a person, at the same rate, their attention to improving themselves, purifying their self increases. And he's giving us a very good criteria, Imam Ali alayhi salam. It says, see, the only thing that you can call knowledge is the one that as you have it, your nafs gets purified. Hello, I want to ask you, 
so many of the things you named in the learn of in the name of religious knowledge. Masalan, the name of that prophet is that. That prophet was in that land. This was the name Khob. Did that purify your soul? I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. It's beautiful curiosity. We go learn all of that. But I'm saying, did it purify your soul? If not, Imam Ali says, it's not the kind of knowledge that can help you. Because the real knowledge, كُلَّمَا زَادَ عِلْمُ الرَّجُلُ زَادَ عِنَايَتُهُ بِنَفْسِهِ See? Saying only that knowledge is going to help you at the end of the day that makes you change inside. Or, عَجِبْتُ لِمَنْ يُنْشِدُ ظَالَتَهُ وَقَدْ أَظَلَّ نَفْسَهَا فَلَا يَطْلُبْهَا I wonder, I'm so surprised at the person who looks for things that he's lost, but he never searches for his soul. Hala goes to religious classes, learns all of those books, prays for 20 years, but has never looked for his own soul. So, by the way, this was meant to be the introduction. It took most of the time for tonight's topic. Now, I know a lot of you may be saying, okay, I want to learn more about myself. I'm, I'm convinced, hopefully, how do I do this self-knowledge? We said, Man all of these things. Okay, it's beautiful, I want it. What do I do? It's such a beautiful thing. But a lot of us, we've even tried, we don't even know what self-knowledge is. How do you find it? How do you gain it? Where do you go? Now, so inshallah, tonight and tomorrow, and also the next night, we're going to start this journey of practical ways of gaining self-knowledge, of looking inside and seeing what's there. You know that poetry which is attributed to Imam Ali alayhi salam? Do you think you're a small entity while within you is the greater universe? This greater universe, where is it? Is it in my belly? Which, I mean, there's a quite large universe for me, but I'm sure that's, no, that's not the one we're talking about. Where is this? We keep reading these hadiths, but how can I find that great universe which is inside me? Inshallah, tonight and tomorrow we're going to be talking about that. Khob. The first step we need to do is to learn a few things. By the way, please pay attention, we're starting the journey now. And this may be the most important thing. Imam Ali said, it's not me. Anfa'ul ma'arif. Anfa'ul ma'arif. The most beneficial thing you can do with your life is this, to look inside. And it can help you with the smallest things of why do I get angry the way I do? From the smallest things like this, like when I have an argument with my parents or with my partner, why is it that we argue differently? Someone gets angry, raises their voice. Someone gets angry, blames the other one. Someone gets angry, leaves the room. Right? I can't take it, they leave the room. From these small questions, it answers you self-knowledge. Why is it that I drive fast, someone else drives slow? Why is it that I fo can't focus on one task? Why is it that I can't stop myself from this sin? Why is it I can't stop myself from this habit? Why is it that I feel jealous? It answers all of these questions, small questions, all the way to questions of where can I find God? Who am I? How can I have unconditional love? How can I have unconditional peace? How can I have a kind of connection to God that nothing can take it away from me? It answers all of those as well. So, tonight we'll just mention a few points about this and we'll take it to the next level tomorrow. Are you awake, by the way? How sleepy are you? We can't go inside if you're sleepy, because then the only thing we'll find is with some snoring. How can we energize you? Should we together all recite the salawat and remember our beautiful prophet? Should we do that? Let's do it. La, Muhammad, salli ala Muhammad, wa ali Muhammad, wa ajil faraj. By the way, when we recite salawat, what we're doing is paying attention to the prophet and trying to you know, bring some of that beauty to our life. Even salawat should lead to inner change. What does it mean to look within? See, in life, you can pay attention to so many different things. I know you can pay attention to this phone, right? And you can see, uh -huh, it has a case, it has some cameras there. Now, when you're looking here, you're not looking there. What does that mean? It's as if your attention is a flashlight that now you've pointed it at here. 
When I say, please point attention to the, pay attention to the phone, your flashlight is here. Everyone's looking at this. Now, if I ask you, for example, pay attention to that window over there, خوب, you turn your flashlight over there, you start seeing it there. This makes sense? This is what attention is. It's as if you have a flashlight, you can point it at a certain place in the world. Right? Okay, I'm going to look at that board. Now I'm going to pay attention there. خوب. That's the first thing. That's what attention is. When we want to gain self-knowledge, what we do is we take that flashlight and we point it inside. I don't want you to look at this phone, not at the person next to you, not at the water bottle in front of you, not at that beautiful smelly clementine, no. Don't put it anywhere, put it inside. Let's do it right now. Turn the flashlight inside. What are you gonna find there? Probably you're gonna find one of these two things. Either you're gonna find a feeling, oh, I'm tired, my knees are hurting, oh, this is interesting, I'm happy, I'm hungry. When you look inside, you're gonna find one of these feelings, or you're gonna be finding a thought. When is this lecture gonna finish? We can't wait to listen to Mullah. They've all come here for Mullah Nizar Ghatari. Why doesn't the Sheikh stop talking? By the way, Mullah, I just wanted to, I wanted to come and uh, say before the lecture, I was a teenager, we used to listen to your beautiful voice. We have so many beautiful memories. I'm a little bit shy. I kept trying to come and say, Mullah, I'm like such a huge fan. I was a little bit shy. I couldn't come. I told my dad that I met Mullah Nizar Qatari. I wanted to go say salam. I was shy. And he said, go, boy, boy, if you don't go, he's going to think you're an arrogant person. So it's difficult. So I wanted to come and say salam. We, I, I think from the, before even I joined the Hose, we used to listen to your beautiful voice and we have such huge fan. Huge fan, thank you so much for all the beautiful moments you've created for all of us. Hope, Alon, you look inside, this may be one of the things you find inside. When does the lecture finish? What's happening? Why did he do this? Why is he embarrassing himself? Right? These thoughts are inside you, or maybe some other thoughts. Oh, this lecture is interesting. So when you point that flashlight inside, you either find a feeling or some thoughts. That's it. And you've probably even tried this. And then you may be wondering, self-knowledge here, I mean, that's it. Just some thoughts and feelings. How is that going to help me? You can't go deeper. Baba, Imam Ali said, man arafa nafsa, faqad arafa rabba. I look inside, I just see hunger and some thoughts. It's as if you hit a dead end. Can you go deeper? Inshallah, tomorrow we'll speak about how can we look inside and not just see a thought and a few feelings. How can we look inside and see much more? And then we will see that how great this space within you is. We're gonna, in the next few nights, I will show things inside you. By the way, I don't want you to take anything because I'm saying it. You will be finding everything I say inside. And I promise you, if you stay with us for the next few nights, you may even feel like you found God inside. Believe me, Imam Ali's promise, Imam Ali alayhi salam's promise. Now you hit a dead end. You feel like this place that I am, I can only find some thoughts and feelings. Where's God? Where's everything else? How is this the most important knowledge? Oh, we've just started. Tomorrow, we will go so much deeper inside. You will know how shaitan attacks you. For the first time, you will know where the temptations of shaitan take place. For the first time, you will find out how does God communicate with you inside you? Imam Hussein in Arafah says that God speaks directly to you. Have you ever felt that? Tomorrow we'll find that out. How does shaitan tempt me? What does it feel like? How does God communicate with me? What can, word can I find inside myself? How am I a great universe? Inshallah, in the next few nights we'll be talking about all of that. But because tonight is such an important night, I don't want to let go without saying things, anything about tonight. Allah, inshallah, the matham, the amal, inshallah, will benefit all of us. I don't want to um, interrupt in that. But I just want to say tonight is such an important night. 
Very important. Believe me. It, for me, for the longest time, I never accepted. Why is it special? What makes it special? It's just a night. I'm very skeptic like that. But believe me, it's so special. Some things happen easier tonight. Especially if you pay attention to what we've been seeing. That whole inner change. If tonight, don't think that I need to gain thawab. I need to do this because it's thawab or I have to, they told me. No, whatever you do, every line of the dua you read, try and be mindful. Why did God ask me to do this? How is this going to help me? Masalan, you're reading Joshan Kabir, beautiful to all. There are certain lines there. Masalan, it says, Ya Karim, Ya Rahman. Think about this. Don't let that go. Just don't say Ya Rahman and go. What does it mean, Ya Rahman? Why should I call God, O oh, loving God? Why is God, listen, read the first 10 names in Joshan Kabir. Although you don't have time to think about all of them, at least the first 10 names in Joshan Kabir. Read through them and see what is it saying. Are there some of them that you can become like? Masalan, it says, Ya Ghaffar. Oh, Masalan, God forgives. It says, Ya Sattar. God covers other people's mistakes, your mistake. Well, ask yourself, can I be like that? Masalan, when my partner, when my child makes a mistake, can I forgive them easily? Can I, Masalan, choose one thing and focus on that? Inner change, inner change. Right? So that's one thing. Take tonight seriously. Focus on your relationship with God. God is there. God is one attention away. As soon as you close your eyes, you can talk to God, even with your open eyes. Try to make it real. Don't look for thawab tonight. Look for God. When God comes, thawab comes too. Oh, so remember this, I need to change. So talk to God honestly. God, I've come here tonight. I want to change. I want to find you. If you've got problems, say, God, this is something I'm dealing with. There's nothing wrong with admitting that. Imam Sajjad has taught us. Allahumma inni ashku ilayka nafsan bisu'a ammara wa ilal khati'ati mubadara. God, tonight I've come to you. Words of Imam Sajjad. There's this part of me which makes me do bad things. I don't want to be doing this bad thing. For example, this is an issue I have. I want to stop it, but my nafs keeps ordering me to do it. Sometimes not even order. It even makes me do it. Hope tell that to God. God, I've got this issue. I've got problem. Help me with this. Be honest. Be real. Be yourself. They say dua can only work if you're there, if you're mindful, if you're present. And they say you can only be mindful and present, presence of heart, if it's a dua you believe in. If it's a dua you really care about. So find that thing you care about and talk to God about it. Now, I don't want to take more of your time. Inshallah, I really hope we all enjoy tonight's amal and we create an inner change. It's a beautiful opportunity. These beautiful lines we'll be reading, these beautiful things, May it, inshallah, lead to a real change, real connection with God. And inshallah, we'll learn from Imam Ali alayhi salam as well. We get so much inspiration to benefit. Uh, please recite the salawat. Wow.